This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I'll start off with a little bit of an introduction. I've known Natalie for about three years. Uh, 10 years ago, I got diagnosed with prostate cancer. Three years ago, I had the, uh, the joy of being uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And I, I happened to be on a trip up in, uh, Van, well, Vancouver, British Columbia, Victoria. And I had found these uh, booklets from the University of California, San Francisco, that were talking about diet and uh, prostate cancer. And I, I noted uh, that there, there were some contradictions from my point of view in terms of how do you do this diet and then do the diet that the American Diabetes Association suggests? Seemed to be conflicts. So I wrote Natalie a note and, uh, you know, she gave me some advice. She said, yeah, we were, she was updating it. She's, she wrote the booklet, booklets, I think, with some of her colleagues. And so I, um, I was in touch with her and she said, well, you know, you can consult with me. And I said, well, I'm going to be in San Francisco next Wednesday or something like that. And so we, we met up then and, um, I just thought that she would be a good person to kick off our first topical meeting. Uh, up to now, we've primarily done support groups, and then we've also done webinars. This is a new animal, I guess, and uh, we'll see if it's any different than anything else. But I want to differentiate this from the webinars because I'm hoping that we're going to be able to have you ask your own questions and, uh, instead of having them filtered by the moderators. Uh, if it gets complicated, we'll have to go back to the, the usual way of doing things. But um, I, I think we can make it work. And part of the way to succeed with this is uh, to not get too lost in the weeds with your personal issues. I mean, if Natalie has a question for you for background, she can ask you. And then let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Natalie. She's a nutrition specialist at the Smith Integrative Oncology uh, Group in San Francisco, and she's the founding dietitian for the nutrition program at the University of California, San Francisco. Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, she's much in demand by the media. She's often interviewed on these topics. So I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie. She's going to do a short presentation and then we'll open up with some questions. Elliot and I may take a stab at some, uh, but feel free to feed the monster and put your, your questions in the chat room. So Natalie, with that, why don't you begin? All right, happy to be here. Thanks for everyone to, to join us this evening. And um, just a couple notes too. Um, if you put, if you have a question, since there are many of you, and you put it in the chat box, I'll try to keep my eye on multiple locations at once and I'll probably see that turn red and then I can kind of see if it's pertinent to a particular slide. I'm happy to kind of discuss it then. And then of course we can get to more Q&A um, once we're complete with the slides. So, um, but definitely, you know, I've been working with prostate patients for over 20 years and really looking at the use of diet and what we can do. Um, and I think it's particularly exciting for active surveillance that there's using diet, using nutrition, using supplements and lifestyle can be a primary mode of really kind of being, uh, being able to treat and, and maintain uh, one's health in relationship to prostate cancer. So I will dive in. Um, this is one of the, a uh, couple, two of the booklets that Howard had um, alluded to. This was the uh, latest one that we put together. Um, I wrote it, but had epidemiologists and some of the researchers just kind of look it over and make sure we were okay. Um, this is the one that has more of the nitty gritty in terms of the diet recommendations. And then the part one is a little bit more um, general, um, but you can access through this um, through 
uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation. You can al also access it directly through the UCSF Urology website, as is noted um, here. And with nutrition and prostate cancer, I think this is always just a good quote uh, from Prostate Cancer Foundation back in 2015, but you know, essentially noting that there is growing scientific evidence that diet and lifestyle practices may indeed slow the growth and progression of prostate cancer. So I don't think this is any news to us, but just further credibility of why you're doing you know, what you're doing. Um, here, just thinking in terms of a general, you know, healthy plate, um, we're looking here to um, see that everything is um, set in terms of not only has to be in a bento box, but that we've got, you know, a good 50% um, of the plate. I'm getting some messages that people aren't seeing the slides. Is that a problem across the board? I'm not yes. seeing the slides. No slides. No slide. Let's see. Hmm. On mine, I'm seeing the slide. How do I switch that on? Go to. Getting a white screen. That's not going to be any good. Joe, do you know how I could see on mine it has the thing it says people only see your paused app. I hope that's going to have me leave the meeting. Um, Natalie, uh, are you using more than one screen? Let me try. So it's on mine and it has share. Yeah, so. So Natalie, this, this is, there you go. This is, this is Rick Davis. There you go. If, if you can, um, we need to, so maybe it, uh, yeah, we, we, I'm getting some feedback. It must be from Hal because he's the only one that isn't muted. Um, if you can, your screen is fine now. Uh, have you okay. maximized your screen? Yeah, the screen's maximized on my end. Okay. So I think that's probably the best we're going to get, guys. Um, that's as big as it's going to get. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah. Everybody can you, can, you can get um, the PDF of these slides, uh, Joe and Howard do have. So in terms of anything, if it, I don't know. On mine, it's the full screen. So I'm not exactly sure what's projecting on your side. But if it's too small and you can't catch, you know, particularly like a long website like this, we can definitely get you uh, get you those slides. We, we will we will post these on the uh, NCAN website after it's over. Uh, okay. What what individuals might want to do, you can shrink the screen where you see the uh, the, the individual camcorders. You can shrink that up, and that'll enlarge the, the visual for the uh, the slides themselves. Also, if everybody's appearing on your screen, you could hide everyone, and it takes those individual pictures away, gives you more space for the uh, viewing the screen. That's probably smart. It may also take away a little bit of the, uh, feedback, too. Okay. So um, back here to our healthy plate, this is not necessarily that it has to, you, be, you have to be eating within a bento box necessarily, but more so that we are loading up your plate with at least 50% um, of that being vegetables and or um, fruits, that we're getting 25% of the plate or so with some sort of protein, plant protein and or some lean animal protein. And then depending on carbohydrate allowance and blood sugar regulation, perhaps up to 25% of the plate with some sort of healthy complex carbohydrate like sweet potatoes, winter squash, pumpkin, brown rice, wild rice, quinoa, you know, things like that. Um, with healthy fats kind of sprinkled throughout in terms of olive oil and avocado and your nuts and your seeds. Um, and really here, I try to emphasize making sure we're getting in a good amount of vegetables with at least two, if not three, of your meals on a daily basis. And 
in terms of which vegetables and fruits do we want to be incorporating. Number one, of course, always keep color in mind. Um, the more colorful your vegetables and fruits, generally that will be a sign of its phytochemical content. So we're eating vegetables and fruits for vitamins, for minerals, for dietary fiber, but a lot of it is for the protective phytochemicals that they provide. And that could be you know, in red foods, of course, we'll talk about lycopene. It could be anthocyanins that we're getting in the blue-purple foods. It could be more of the sulforaphanes that we're getting in some of the green vegetables and, you know, things like they're able to inactivate carcinogens and things like garlic. So we want to have a blend of different types of um, colors within your, you know, typical meals. Um, this is a slide taken from Dr. David Heber's book. He's at UCLA. Um, there's also a book that's similar called Color Code um, that if we're ever thinking you just want a quick read of, wait, why am I having things of these different colors? It goes through what are the specific phytochemicals that are found in these different colorful vegetables and fruits? And then of course, providing you examples of what those would be. So um, that part um, is all, um, Good in that. Uh, of course, lycopene, it's hard to give a presentation, I think particularly with active surveillance and not mention lycopene, um, even if we're trying to squeeze things into 20, 30 minutes to allow ample time for Q&A. Um, but lycopene definitely is something that we have seen in research, particularly food sources. We have not seen the same kind of data supported with lycopene supplements. But in terms of the food sources, lycopene does appear to have a significant inhibitory effect on prostate cells and could be a very important component to incorporate in a daily diet. And you can see, of course, tomato-based foods are the richest um, and we get greater lycopene content if the tomatoes have been cooked. Hence, you'll see you know, the you know, tomato paste uh, being quite high, tomato sauce. Uh, being higher where you have to have several tomatoes, uh, raw tomatoes to have as much lycopene. Um, additionally, just a note that lycopene is a fat soluble carotenoid so that it does need a little bit of fat to be properly absorbed. Um, so if you were making a marinara sauce and serving that over some vegetables, a dash of olive oil on that um, would definitely help to further enhance um, your capability of absorbing the lycopene in the system. It doesn't need to be with fried chicken, but just a little bit of a healthy fat to be able to better enhance the absorption of that. And similarly, if you're having a glass of tomato juice, perhaps rather than having tomato juice on an empty stomach, have it, you know, with a meal and or have it with, you know, a couple of nuts or, you know, a little bit of olive or a little bit of avocado or something to help better help you absorb the lycopene. Um, another group of um, vegetables that I think are absolutely crucial to be incorporating would be the cruciferous vegetables. Um, these are rich in a variety of different phytochemicals. Um, this one is noting the um, glucosinolate content, but we also look at isothiocyanates uh, and just general these sulforaphane or just kind of sulfury, you know, kind of based compounds. And cruciferous vegetables continually have benefits. And when we look at data in terms of being inversely related to uh, prostate cancer and other types of cancers as well, but they also do have a very favorable effect on hormone metabolism. And so that could be one of the you know, key reasons why we're looking particularly at cruciferous vegetables for hormonally related cancers like prostate cancer. So I do think it's wise to incorporate cruciferous vegetables on a daily basis. Um, if there is a thyroid condition, then you probably want to be limiting of the raw cruciferous vegetables and have, you know, maybe a little more in the way of some cooked cruciferous vegetables or at least space your raw cruciferous vegetables that they would not be taken at the same time as of a thyroid medication. And if there are digestive challenges, cooking, you know, steaming, kind of roasting the vegetables will definitely make it much more easy to digest and absorb than if you have a raw um, kale salad or raw Brussels sprout salad, which are fantastic, but if it's difficult for you from a digestive purpose, we can also work, uh, work through that. 
So these are great to be incorporated. You can see here a variety of different ones that are noted. Brussels sprouts winning out, um, but also would incorporate everything from broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and horseradish and turnips and these different greens and a variety of others. Um, this one gives you a pretty good list. I also incorporate a full list in the Prostate Cancer Foundation um, booklet that you can kind of see the full list there. Um, this one you can look at in terms of what about the issue in, reg in relationship to organic or not organic. And this slide is from the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org is their website. And what they do on an annual basis is they create the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And essentially what those are are the 12 produce items that have the greatest toxicity in terms of the number of pesticides and or the greatest amounts of a certain pesticide on particular vegetables and fruits. And then they have the flip of the 15 that tend to be the absolute cleanest with the lowest amount of pesticides, toxicide, you know, kind of toxic residues uh, and so forth. So this list does change on an annual basis um, to some extent, although you tend to find strawberries and spinach and oftentimes even um, some of the peppers and things like that pretty high up there on the list but it's always a good idea to just keep this list in mind i would say that if you can purchase organic i would encourage one to do that uh, in terms of not only getting lesser of these pesticides but we do um, see some data that suggests that organic produce will have a greater concentration of phytochemicals if it's not available then rather than purchasing you know something like you know, conventional grown strawberries, I would opt for a fruit that you enjoy on the Clean 15 list instead. So you can kind of, um, you know, look a little bit kind of both of those um, areas. Question came in in terms of is there a place to go to find out how best to consume vegetables and fruits? Understand that more potent raw than cooked. Um, so here I'd say that generally, I think it's great to have a combination of raw and cooked, as long as digestion can handle that. Um, the carotenoids, things like lycopene, all the different tomato-based products, but also beta carotene, things that are orange in terms of carrots and pumpkin and things like that, those are all better, they're all fat soluble. So those do do a little bit, you know, have a little bit greater absorption if um, they are consumed cooked and or a little bit with some oil. Um, but again, you're still going to have great absorption in terms of a lot of these in terms of raw. If you think about vitamin C, you're going to get greater amount of vitamin C in the raw tomato, but you're going to get a greater amount of lycopene in the cooked tomato. So you want to have a combination of uh, raw and cooked you know, in your diet. I'd say the biggest thing is that you want to make sure that your cooked foods are not mutilated. You still want them to be brightly colored. Uh, and if they turn more towards a, you know, a green vegetable becoming more of a brown olive green color we've kind of a little bit too far too far and i think also if you keep a little bit of a crunch in it that's a sign that you probably are going to have optimal uh nutrient um you know amount there in terms of you know if you take a look at uh, there's some some of that within the, the documents but we could certainly think of other resources we could think of that would be helpful um in, in that list again this um is from the Environmental Working Group. You can go to ewg.org uh, and they'll email you this list and I think you can get a little one that can go in a wallet. Um, and I think that's why there's this uh, perforated line you know, down the center here. So let's talk a little bit further about uh, diet and really in terms of sugar uh, and kind of why that could be a possible concern. And even before we dive directly into sugar, we know that a Western lifestyle, which is characterized by a variety of factors, including typically a low physical activity as well as a high overall caloric intake, but also one that typically is high in animal protein, high in saturated fats, trans fats, and those rapidly digestible carbohydrates. When referring to rapidly digestible carbohydrates, this is more in the line of refined sugars, refined grains, processed foods. We are not talking about fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains, legumes in this category. We know that that lifestyle 
is definitely associated with the increased risk of a variety of different types of chronic diseases, including prostate cancer, including type 2 diabetes, including having a negative effect on immune system, obesity, and more. And one of the thoughts there is that this could be mediated uh, by insulin and IGF, or insulin-like growth factor. And insulin and IGF may promote the development of tumors by inhibiting the process of apoptosis, which is where you're just focusing on kind of cancer cells dying. Um, additionally, insulin and IGF are um, you know, likely related to stimulating the proliferation of cells, stimulating the synthesis of sex steroids, which of course is an issue for hormonally related cancers like prostate cancer, modulating genetic expression in a negative way, you know, um, and also inhibiting the synthesis of sex hormone binding globulin. So here we're thinking, okay, let's think further about insulin, IGF, and how do we help to modulate our levels of insulin and IGF? So one thing is, what about our overall sugar intake? Because we know that approximately 80% of our food items in the U.S. grocery aisles are spiked with added sugar. Uh, and while this isn't a presentation on diabetes, um, you know, as Howard definitely already alluded to, it's a definitely, it is a huge challenge. And we it's estimated that a third of us are going to have diabetes by 2050. Um, and this is an area that we can definitely work to improve. And I think in terms of, you know, if we are looking at a box of Oreo cookies, you expect to see sugar, you know, in those. But if you're looking at a salad dressing, if you're looking at a tomato sauce, if you're looking at, you know, sometimes other healthful foods, we're not expected to see added sugar. And yet in a general, you know, typical market, we will find that to be the case. So we want to look for these sources of added sugars and work to remove them or minimize them within our diet. Um, this is just a list of some different whole grains and legumes in terms of providing kind of the opposite. Again, those are going to provide a significant amount of vitamins, minerals, dietary fiber, which help to bind toxins and so forth, but also provide you a lot of those protective phytochemicals. One thing you can always keep in mind is the 10 to 1 rule. So if you're at the market, if you're looking at a box or some you know, package or label, for every 10 grams of total carbohydrates that are listed on the label, you want there to be at least one gram or more of dietary fiber. If you see something that has 40 grams of carbohydrate, then I, of course I'd want you to have at least four grams of dietary fiber, if not more. If it doesn't fit that rule in an ideal scenario, put it back on the shelf. That's not something we want to be incorporating. And I know a lot of our really healthy foods don't even have a nutrition label, but a lot of foods that we do, you know, of course, do have labels. And so this is something you can always keep in mind um, when you're, you know, identifying and evaluating a particular food. If you're incorporating a packaged bread or cereal into the diet, make sure you're probably getting at least three grams of fiber per serving, just as a general rule. There could be some areas you may want more and exceptions, but in just a general rule, that's something to kind of keep in mind. Again, we want to have kind of typically lesser sugars and greater amounts of dietary fiber. Now, where do you, you know, see sugar? We've said we can find it in various health foods as well as the obvious sources of cookies and cakes and so forth. And it may hide in a name of a, some other name. So this slide here just shows you various names that you will see that basically means that there is added sugar in that particular food. So you know probably about high fructose corn syrup, but here's a list, I didn't count them, but I think we've got a good 20 plus on um, other sources of added sugars. Be aware of these when you are looking at ingredients um, in terms of different food lists. How do we know if this is really a challenge for you? Here are some labs that you could consider. And I would say that likely you're all having your glucose values measured, maybe not fasting. It is, I think, a good idea to at least sometimes have that marker measured when you are in a fasted state. But I definitely think looking at hemoglobin A1C is a marker that everyone should be looking at. And if it looks 
If your level is 4.9, you're at 5.1, clearly you're under that 5.4 percentage part, I'd say fantastic. Keep it there, keep an eye on it and look at it every year. If you're above 5.4, we want to target that. We want to move that marker down a little bit and we can, we'll can. we talk about how we're going to do that. And then I would say we want to keep an eye on that marker. This is a marker that's looking at your blood sugar over the previous two to three months. So you don't need to look at it every week or every month, but you could um, look at it as soon as every few months to make sure that you're seeing a difference there. Um, insulin, as I, we were just talking about, is another marker. Typically, I like to look at that between 5 and 10. If we get above 10, definitely suggesting more hyperinsulinemia, uh, insulin resistant issues. If you have no insulin in the system, probably tells me adrenals are shot, and we got to really support that to help make sure that we're balancing your blood sugar. Um, C peptide is another area that we could um, evaluate, but if we are thinking that physicians are going to, you know, kind of balk or fight back a little bit when you're asking them, just simply ask for the A1C value. Definitely worth doing. Um, the why would we look at that is markers of A1C, markers of insulin, that those are elevated, generally associated with a poor survivorship um, across the board, and definitely with prostate, we want to keep that blood sugar under control. So what would be some dietary strategies that we could utilize to help improve glycemic control? Of course, avoiding um, the white foods and not talking about cauliflower and garlic here, but you know what I mean in terms of the refined flours and sugars and sweets. Make sure we're incorporating healthy fats into the diet, uh, particularly omega-3 fatty acids, possibly there using cold water fish, maybe some chia seeds, possibly ground flaxseed, maybe some walnuts. Those are all decent sources of omega-3s. Um, when you're incorporating carbohydrates into different meals or snacks, make sure that they're not just eating carbs alone, like just one plate of pasta or rice or an apple, combine it with a little bit of protein and healthy fat so that your blood sugar does not spike up and go down when you have peaks and valleys, but instead slower, kind of more rolling hills. Limit those starchy carbohydrates, you know, to just one, maybe three, you know, servings a day so that we're not getting an excessive amount of those. Um, definitely limit beverages that are adding sugars. Avoid high fructose corn syrup entirely. Could be other challenges even in terms of liver health. Um, be cautious, I think, with evening snacking. Um, and partly there is when we eat in the evening, it tends to be more comfort foods. It's not normally snacking on broccoli and, you know, jicama, you know, sticks and things like that. So we're just being cautious of that. But also the fact that we can talk about this maybe in terms of Q&A, the idea of intermittent fasting could offer some added protection, improved cardiometabolic benefits. Stopping eating at a little of an earlier side, maybe say 6, 7, 8 p.m. And then giving yourself a solid 12, 13, 14 or so hours overnight fast um, and that could be adjusted even possibly to more but even as a starting point. Um, reducing caffeine intake, uh, limiting to avo or avoiding alcohol. Um, this is a question came in in terms of diabetes discussion. This could be diabetes. This is overall no diabetes at all. If you have prostate cancer, if you have any kind of cancer, if you just want to look at chronic health, you wanna make sure you're looking at this information. This is a crucial piece, a driving force in terms of cancer's bottom line. So we wanna look at those A1C values where we wanna potentially assess insulin and know how, if it is elevated, what do we do about it? Um, another area that I think is absolutely crucial in terms of a key nutritional terrain that does affect uh, prostate cancer would be inflammation. Um, these are some different markers that I think are also wise to uh, possibly request from your uh, medical team to assess is inflammation an issue for you. Um, high sensitivity C-reactive protein is a marker of overall systemic inflammation. Fibrinogen is another marker of inflammation. Sedimentation rate or sed rate, um, oftentimes tied to autoimmune issues, but again, giving us some inform information on in the, the inflammatory process. And then homocysteine is a marker of vascular inflammation. Again, why do we look at inflammation? Elevated levels of inflammatory you know, markers here, they are shown to definitely promote the cancer process and are associated with poor prognosis and poor survivorship. 
we want these values to be in line. And if they're not, don't, don't panic, we'll work to get them there. But we wanna make sure that we are assessing the inflammatory values just the same way we are establishing and looking at those glycemic markers. What would uh, potentially affect your inflammatory markers in terms of different types of nutrients? Um, you can see here a variety of different, um, you know, different kinds of nutrients. This is from a spectra cell test um, that I oftentimes run that I just look at all of these different nutrients for individuals so that, because clearly you're not going to be taking all 15 or 20 of these different compounds. It's more of which ones would be the most beneficial for you as an individual. If you have replete levels of CoQ10 and your B vitamins and zinc and magnesium, you likely wouldn't need to add those you know, further as a supplemental source. But if you are deficient in those, we may seriously want to consider incorporating those to help balance your inflammatory levels. Just to clarify, as another question came in, the different labs that I posted thus far, yes, are all blood tests. Mainstream should be able to be run through your insurance, whatever that may be, Medicare and or private insurance. Um, any physician should be able to add those and put in appropriate diagnostic codes that would make that be covered through your insurance. Um, this um, pyramid here, this is from Dr. Andrew Weil. Um, this is an anti-inflammatory food pyramid, just in kind of giving you another um, you know, illustration to help um, exemplify what we want to be really focusing on, where the base of our food is coming a lot from those plant foods, lots of vegetables and fruits, having potentially some whole grains, beans or leg uh, beans and legumes. Pasta on here, I don't really think you have to have pasta two to three times a week. It's more so that um, I think one, Andy Well likes to incorporate it because he likes it, but I think also he likes to point out that when pasta is cooked al dente, where it, as opposed to being cooked all the way through, um, it does not affect your blood sugar as much, has a lesser glycemic effect. So that's something if we are incorporating pastas, I do think it could be to your advantage to cook it al dente rather than kind of overcook it. Um, lots of omega-3 fatty acids, lots of herbs and spices, and then up at the tippy top, limited amounts in terms of sugars. You know, maybe we could incorporate some dark chocolate as some antioxidant rich um, foods with a little amount of sugar, um, potentially some, um, you know, red wine in terms of some cardiovascular uh, benefits. And with prostate cancer, at this point, alcohol does not appear to have a be a, you know, strong promoter of prostate cancer. Um, where that could come into play, would be if you do have blood sugar regulation issues and or weight is an issue, then we may want to look at alcohol from that purpose. Um, but having a little bit of alcohol just in the you know, just for the sake of prostate cancer does not appear to actually, you know, promote nor inhibit, um, you know, the growth. Um, here's a picture just to kind of look at our essential fatty acids. This is key in terms of the balance of these being crucial to overall proper um, prostaglandin metabolism. Um, so here we wanna um, typically be focusing on getting more omega-3 fatty acids into the diet because we tend to have an excessive amount of omega-6 and not enough omega-3s. And if we can have a more appropriate balance between these two families, then that can even be possible to help reverse uh, disease processes. So for your beneficial omega-3 fatty acids, that's again where the cold water fish, your chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, and so forth are. Those again help to focus on having an anti-inflammatory effect, inhibiting the growth of tumors and the process of angiogenesis or being able to potentially fuel tumors. Um, enhancing immune system. Um, and if we are in the situation of using chemotherapy, it can even, um, and or radiation therapy, it possibly could enhance the effects of chemo uh, and or radiation. Um, where we see the flip of the omega-6 fatty acids, again, we do have some healthy omega-6 fatty acids, but in general, we tend to have too many of those. And where do we get those in the diet? particularly our animal protein in terms of meats, particularly those that are grain fed as opposed to grass fed, butter, whole milk, egg yolks, and then a lot of the 
common vegetable oils um, that typically we don't want to be utilizing. I'd rather you use avocado oil or olive oil that would be much more neutral, but we generally want to avoid some of the common generic kind of vegetable oils that have corn oil and soft, you know, cottonseed oils and sunflower oils. Those are ones you want to be limiting or avoiding for the most part. Um, here's just a slide in terms of meat and cancer and kind of how strong is this evidence. Um, bottom line here, just in terms of giving a quick little synopsis, processed meats, definitely uh, a significant concern. Um, red meat would be kind of the next category to uh, be more cautious of. There is some research that red meat could be an issue with prostate cancer specifically. Um, white meat in terms of chicken and turkey does, it, does appear to have a lesser effect in terms of really seeing directly with prostate cancer appeals to be pretty neutral. Um, and in you know, a fish, I think would actually be two ones benefit possibly in terms of the strong omega-3 fatty acids that it does contain. Um, so here's a kind of a, just a basic slide on which types of fats would we want to be incorporating. Um, these are gonna be not only your omega-3 fats that we've talked about, but also your neutral and cardioprotective omega-9 or monounsaturated fatty acids like olive oil, and avocados, and almond butter, and things like that, um, all good fats to be incorporating into a diet um, on a regular basis. And then ultimately, what are we really looking for for improving nutrition? And that is, number one, let's see if we can boost your energy. I think also the healthier you eat, the greater desire you have to continue eating those nourishing foods and a lesser desire for foods that may, may, may not be providing us much nutritive value. Um, being able to see improvements in lab values having more stable glucose control, which also has you feel better physically, but it is definitely an important prognostic factor for prostate cancer. Uh, improving muscle mass, strength, flexibility, boosting metabolism, enhancing your immune function, and overall improving your quality of life and sense of well-being. So if I summarize and just, I couldn't quite get it on to one slide unless I made it a font that would be pretty much uh, in you know, not able to be um, read. So from two slides, I would say eat eight to 10 colorful vegetables and fruits a day. I would like to see double, triple the amount of vegetables than fruits. So six or more vegetables, two, three fruits as a general idea. Um, get them in lunch, get them in dinner, you'll meet that goal. We wait all the way to the end of the day and have no vegetables and fruits. It's gonna be a challenging time to get all of those in in one meal. If you get in all those vegetables and fruits, you're on your way of meeting your fiber goal. That's going to probably give you a good 20 plus grams of fiber right there. You add in some chia seeds, a little bit of nuts and seeds, or a little bit of whole grains, you will be well above the 30 grams of fiber for a daily basis, um, which would be beneficial for prostate cancer, but also going to be beneficial for cardiovascular purposes as well. Limiting or avoiding altogether processed, refined grains, flours, and sugars, incorporating protein with every meal, making sure we have some sort of plant protein, um, you know, daily. Question was asked in terms of what about things like, you know, Beyond Meat. Um, Beyond is generally a pea protein base. Um, I think it's okay to incorporate some. I wouldn't live entirely on Beyond Meat, just because I do think that there's some you know, uh, chemical component to kind of creating it. It's not necessarily an entirely whole food, but I do think it's okay to incorporate uh, some Beyond Meats in there. Um, limiting or eliminating entirely fatty and processed meats and dairy. Possibly we'll get into talking about dairy. There is some concern of dairy being a factor, particularly for advanced prostate cancer uh, and definitely whole milk dairy products, but even non-fat ones. Uh, making sure we are incorporating those healthy fats like we've discussed. Um, consuming herbs and spices on a daily basis, be liberal with those. They are going to be your richest antioxidant sources. So garlic, ginger, turmeric, cayenne, rosemary, basil, thyme, whatever it is you enjoy, load up on herbs and spices, an excellent addition to your diet. Uh, limit alcohol consumption, uh, maybe drink 
one, maybe even up to four cups of green tea a day for the added protection of the polyphenols, the phytochemicals that are found in green tea that could have some protective um, components against prostate cancer. Um, I think definitely makes sense to be looking at our vitamin D levels. Um, we definitely want it above 40. I would say having a vitamin D level of 60 is a little more ideal. That also can be a mainstream blood work easily added um, to a, you know, to one of your um, typical labs just to make sure that that, that value is in good standing. Make sure we're drinking plenty of um, fluids, ideally water or non-caffeinated beverages like herbal teas, um, things like that daily just to help kind of make sure that you are adequately hydrated. Um, engage in daily physical activity to help either achieve and or maintain a healthy body weight. That is important because we do see that obesity and being at a higher body weight is a risk factor for prostate cancer, particularly advanced prostate cancer. Um, and then I definitely think that stress management is a crucial role um, here. So considering, you know, whatever works for you, it could be exercise, it could be yoga, it could be meditation, it could be uh, this, this kind of support group. It could be kickboxing, it could be screaming, it could be art, whatever works for you just to help in terms of overall stress reduction, I think is a very key piece. And um, some of you may be very familiar with uh, Dr. Ornish, um, and he definitely always incorporates stress reduction as part of his protocols, whether it be for cardiovascular benefits or specifically for prostate cancer, but a lot of different resources that are at your fingertips um, for that. Um, and I know I kind of ran through some things. We definitely have some time for questions and answers. I just thought I'd put um, my company up here um, on the slide. If you have, you know, questions that you're like, oh, I want to, you know, get on Natalie's list so I'm getting her, you know, newsletter every other week to know what's going on or every, you know, two times a month I send out a newsletter. I'm happy to put you on that. If you want to know more in terms of the microbiome, I do have a free webinar that's currently up on my website. Um, you can look through the blog of some of the other previous posts um, and we can talk a little more if obviously if there is interest in any kind of individual consultation. These days in particular, uh, Zoom has become one of our good friends, whether we like it or not. So easily video consults, phone consults are uh, definitely a doable um, option. But I will kind of leave it there and open it up to Q&A. I think I did uh, answer the different chat questions that came through, but if there are more, let me know. Well, you know, I, I can uh, help steer you a bit if that's okay. Sure. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. I, I, I'm going to kick it off. I, and you did a good job of answering everybody's questions as you went along there. So, but if anybody else wants to enter some in the box or if they, they want to speak up a little bit later and ask questions, that's fine. But I, I want to ask you about a study that just by coincidence I happen to be in, which is the meals study from, I think, uh, your alma mater, uh, University of California, San Diego. Um, they did a study where they they gave you um, as a minimum, which is what I got, I was in the control group, I got a pamphlet on what to do about diet and it was next to useless. The other group um, got counseling and I, you know, I was kind of pissed off that I got left out. So I, I joined Weight Watchers and lost 40 pounds just to get even. But that aside, uh, after all these years, they came out with a report in, in JAMA. And uh, the, the researcher, Dr. Uh, J. Kellogg Parsons, summarized it. And he said, these data indicate that despite prevailing scientific and public opinion, eating more vegetables will not alter the course of prostate cancer. It will not, to the best of our knowledge, suppress or cure it. So, you know, what, what's your take on the, on the meals study? 
I have to look at that one closer. I know you um, emailed me that today. I haven't had a chance in between patients to look at it uh, closely, but I would say, and I'm not sure, I wonder if uh, John Pierce and that group with UCSD is part of this um, kind of counseling group. We did a study with breast cancer. We did a study with colon cancer one uh, many years back. Uh, back and you know went to UCSD as my undergrad and uh, worked with UCSD on the well study for many years um, and so I'm wondering if it's the same group and kind of the same idea um, I would say that one thing that I would wonder is what's the difference of vegetable consumption in the control group versus the um, you know intervention group and I would wonder one is the intervention group really eating eight to ten servings of vegetables on a daily basis or are they eating five um number one number two which of those vegetables are they consuming do they have 30 milligrams of lycopene daily do they have cruciferous vegetables daily do they have some of the sulfur compounds like garlic onion family that allium group do they have those daily I think those are some areas that we definitely want to assess. Um, but I also think that, you know, as much as we want to definitely think, or want to have these vegetables, you know, have a positive influence, I think it's going to be a synergistic component. It's not just eating broccoli. It's not just eating tomatoes. It's not just eating vegetables. It's eating vegetables, eating some fruit, not having the sugar, controlling all those blood sugar markers, controlling the inflammatory markers, keeping the stress chemistry controlled, making sure we have health. It's a bigger picture of how do we get all of the pieces into the puzzle to make it work. And if we only put one piece in, it's part of it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the same success as if you have the entire puzzle put together. Well, Natalie, that's a good lead in to a question uh, from Ken Mason, because you were talking about the synergistic effect of, of doing these multiple things. But what Ken is alluding to is that, it, you know, this, is, this may be brand new for a lot of us. And uh, this could be major changes, he says. So what would you suggest as a starting point? You were just saying uh, the cruciferous vegetables by themselves are enough. But he says, what two or other steps would you recommend to get started? I would say partially we want to choose, you know, two steps that you think are doable for you. Um, and so that could be different for some of you versus other. Um, I would also ideally love to base that on your biochemistry. If, for example, we know your hemoglobin A1C is 4.9 and inflammation is 5.0, meaning A1C and blood sugar looks fantastic, but inflammation is elevated, then I may kind of focus on something different than if the case was reversed. But if we don't know any of that information, I would say that I, my focus would be to first start with adding nourishing foods to your diet as opposed to focusing on what you don't want to have in the diet one that helps you to not just get in you know these beneficial components but likely if you fill yourself up on vegetables and fiber rich foods you're going to have less sugar you're going to have less processed foods naturally so i would say make sure you're getting in vegetables with two or more of your meals a day whether that's a bag of baby carrots, it's little baby tomatoes you're snacking on, it's tomato sauce, tomato sauce, excuse me, out of a jar, um, it's some roasted vegetables, it's leftover vegetables from the previous night, um, you've heated up some frozen broccoli in the microwave, whatever works for you, uh, but I think that is one thing that I think that could be fantastic. Um, and then I would, in terms of specifically for active surveillance, what do we want to, you know, put in there? Um, generally, I would say that I'd want to make sure you have some protein with meals and this to, to help make sure we don't have too much carbohydrate or fat at a meal. It helps to kind of balance um, those out, even if it's just simply those two pieces. Or another option would be, how can I get some sort of tomato-based product in my diet on a regular basis? Do I have tomato juice? Do I have tomato sauce? Do I have tomato paste? What of those things could I do easily and incorporate on a regular basis? And just focus on a couple things. I definitely agree. Do two things, master those, and then we'll add more you know, to, um, to that list. 
Um, another question came in in terms of which fresh um, herbs and spices would be best. Um, you know, honestly, again, could be based on what your biochemistry is like. Um, if we are looking at inflammation, turmeric is absolutely fantastic. Um, turmeric also has a COX-2 like property. So it acts kind of acts as a COX-2 inhibitor, um, just the same way that we see as some of these anti-inflammatory medications. Um, that could be an excellent one to incorporate. Garlic is also great as an anti-inflammatory agent. Um, I would say, you know, that turmeric probably has the greatest amount of anti-cancer research across the board. It's a little bit more bitter, so it could be a little having to be creative of how do we incorporate that. Um, there is a way to make it to a turmeric type of paste and then make it into a little, um, you know, a little golden milk kind of tea or a, an option. I can definitely get, you know, recipes. You can probably look up recipes on how to do that. I think that would could be an excellent option. Um, I would think too, if we need a little bit in terms of gut motility um, or settling gut, ginger is an excellent option in there as well. Um, but turmeric, garlic, ginger would be some of the top ones, but I'm definitely open to many, many more. Um, well, let let me butt in and ask you, in terms of, uh, you mentioned protein, and I, I know that a, a number of the men in this group are on uh, plant-based diets. Can they get wow. adequate protein from a plant-based diet? Yeah, you, that would be coming from beans, lentils, tofu, tempeh, you know, beyond meats, pea protein, you know, MycoPure Designs for Health has a mushroom based uh, protein powder, a little stronger taste, but um, it's a you know great one. And I can definitely get, if anyone's actually interested in looking at any kinds of ones, I do have a 20% uh, discount that happy to pass on to anyone that I can easily um, share um, for that, you know, as well. Um, and in fact, I think there was a question on dietary supplements. Um, right. Really what I do, um, Hugh, is I tend to base recommendations on your biochemistry. So once I know what's going on with, you know, where the, you know, greatest priorities lie, whether that's deficient in B vitamins or D or no, we need inflammatory mark, you know, inflammatory is elevated or no, that looks fantastic. Um, but some that I would say it's hard to go wrong with would be vitamin D as in dog. Um, I would like to have that level at 60. So oftentimes people are using 2000 or 5000 IU, sometimes more, but I think generally 2000 to 5000 IU of D3 daily could be good. You want that with food because it is a fat soluble compound. Um, I would also say that I think that the research with omega-3 fatty acids is a good, you know, it's just a good area for anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, cardiovascular benefits for skin for so many factors that I think that, um, you know, something like the Nordic Naturals uh, Pro Omega 2000, there it's the most potent capsule um, on the market in terms of being so concentrated of EPA and DHA um, is a great one there. Um, I do oftentimes also look at mushroom supplements for therapeutic purposes in terms of anti-cancer effects, as well as really benefiting the immune system. Um, if I had to pick only one, I would say that turkey tail, it's also known as Coriolis versicolor, is the most, has the most research for anti-cancer activity uh, as a particular mushroom strain. Um, another question had also come through related to pomegranate. Um, I think we talked a little bit in terms of um, turmeric. There, you know, one particular trial looking at pomegranate possibly slowing the rise of uh, PSA, not only you're going to get a lot of polyphenols, which are the same type of phytochemicals that you get in green tea, that does appear to have some, you know, very protective uh, properties for prostate cancer. Um, one of the challenges with pomegranate is if we get pomegranate juice, you're also getting a lot of sugar. So there I'd be more inclined to use a pomegranate concentrate. So you're getting in the loaded amount of those polyphenols, but you're not getting in the higher sugar content. And I definitely think, it, particularly at this time of the year, now that pomegranates are in season, 
Um, you can also, of course, eat those fresh, um, and that can be a great source of getting in dietary fiber, but also getting in a rich amount of those protective polyphenols. We certainly need more research there, but there is a little bit of preliminary data that's intriguing related to pomegranate specific with prostate cancer. Um, can I, can I question ask you came in, is a slow, gradual change more apt to succeed than a radical total change? Um, one thing I've learned with working with prostate cancer patients over the last 20 plus years is prostate guys, you guys can do whatever, you guys can do it all. Um, so I think really there it's an individual um, choice. In general, my MO is like, okay, let's make sure that you're doing this in a doable, attainable, achievable fashion so that, yeah, if we change everything, you may only follow that for one week or two weeks. Um, so I would rather make sure that we are making changes that are going to be life lasting. So oftentimes we would do that in terms of two at a time. Okay, I've mastered these two goals. Now I add another two goals and you build on that appropriately. Um, I'm not anti-radical change and I definitely have seen it. And particularly if I pick any population that I've worked with in the last 20 plus years, Prostate patients are some of the most highly motivated patients that I've encountered. Um, and I definitely think that that could be a doable, um, you know, doable to attention to it. But in general, I want to make sure that we're not, it's not going to have a backlash or sabotaging effect um, in, in the very near future, you know, following that. Now, um, I think Elliot wanted to sneak a question in there. Well, I, I just, I had some questions about specific foods because some of them came up in your presentation. One was on, on one of the things it said green, white, or oolong tea. Is oolong tea as good as green tea? So green, white, and oolong are, I mean, all part of the same tea leaf, just a matter of how much they've been processed. Um, white, where it hasn't really been at all. Green, it's been steamed, and oolong's been kind of slow. But if you keep going, black tea is also all part of that tea leaf. And black tea's been shown to have beneficial properties as well, although if you look at research, green teas had more. Um, I've seen less with oolong, but I would say it's likely going to fall in between the green tea and the black tea. So still pro you know, adding properties and beneficial effects, but you may even get a little more with green. Um, I had a couple of other food questions. One was, um, if you have, if you make vegetable soup, does that count as like a bunch of vegetables? <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you, I mean, depending on if your vegetable soup that you're having, not counting this, like, you know, all the broth, but if you have two cups of vegetables in your vegetable soup, then yeah, you've got four vegetable servings right there. Absolutely. Great. The broth, um, I would say, I wouldn't count that part. It's not bad for you, but I wouldn't count that part. Right, right. Uh, another question I have is because you'd mentioned that maybe you would talk about dairy a little bit. Um, and so that's my, I have a question about dairy. And what about grass-fed dairy? Does that make a difference since grass-fed meat matters? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, at this point, there hasn't been research to look at grass-fed dairy and how that is directly impacting insulin and some like growth factor. Um, I'd be curious to kind of see what we find, you know, with research moving forward in that area. Um, you know, I always think of a patient I had many years back and he worked at a dairy, not a grass fed one, not an organic one. This was, you know, so many, many, many years back. Um, and interestingly, he and every guy that he worked with at that dairy was diagnosed with prostate cancer and they would have free dairy. So naturally, um, you know, they ate a lot of dairy just because they would get it free and that way it was more affordable. Um, in that sense. So I definitely think it's an area that we need to do more research, um, but we don't really know the answer to that yet. I would still think though that grass fed is going to be better. The biggest difference with grass fed is you're going to get a higher amount of omega-3s. You're not going to get as much of uh, saturated fats and much of the omega-6 fatty acids. So I think the fatty acid profile will be different. Um, it's still going to have casein, the milk protein, which we know does have an inflammatory effect. Um, but I think we need more research on that area to really give you, you know, a true scientific response. And Natalie, uh, during your presentation, you had mentioned uh, intermittent fasting. I think in the 
context of uh, regulating blood sugar. But you know, what, what is the advantage to um, to these men uh, with prostate cancer as far as fasting goes? So fasting, I mean, obviously we use it for many, many years for therapeutic properties. Thus far, it's definitely, I think, early in terms of the cancer research. Um, where I honestly use it the most for cancer is related to chemotherapy, which fortunately, hopefully, is not the case for anyone in active surveillance, um, where I do think it possibly could enhance the effects of chemo uh, and being able to better target cancer cells specifically. And there's some evidence in terms of fasting kind of around chemotherapy infusions. Uh, in terms of active surveillance, I'd say, number one, we don't have research specifically of looking at intermittent fasting and active surveillance. There, I would say that because it does have beneficial effects in terms of cardiometabolic properties and possibly in terms of weight management, that that could then indirectly benefit someone um, who's undergoing active surveillance if we need to improve lipid markers, blood sugar markers, insulin levels, body weight. That's how we would probably would see it being to the most benefit for, you know, the average person with active, you know, doing active surveillance. Now, now Kevin uh, Melberger brought up the idea of, of cannabinoid therapies to reduce inflammation. Uh, do, you know, is there much known about that? Is that recommended for us? Well, and I'm definitely not an expert in terms of CBD, but I would say that where I've seen CBD be the most beneficial um, is helping symptom management. So undoubtedly, I see CBD be very beneficial uh, in helping those with um, you know, nausea, with appetite, with relaxing in terms of stress, in terms of inducing sleep um, you know, there. In terms of will it actually help to shrink cancer cells, it's too early to tell. I have not seen any data to support that, nor necessarily refute that, but I don't have any data to, to support that. Um, from an inflammatory perspective, I haven't seen data to show that we see lower amounts of inflammatory markers with CBD, but we know that CBD can be helpful in modulating pain, and we know that pain would be an inflammatory type of condition. So the thought, I would think, would be that maybe we will see some benefits along uh, along this path, but I think we need more research um, in relationship to CBD and infl inflammation and definitely cancer in general. You know, um, this this is a little walk in, in a different direction. And I know a couple of men in this group uh, try to alkalize their bodies in terms of the water that they drink and so on. And uh, well, here's here's the question from one of them. Should we consider alkalizing our bodies as cancer can't grow in an alkaline environment? I would say there that, again, we need more research to really, uh, you know, we have a, a very narrow pH that we can live. Um, and so if you alkalize too much, we die. If we're too acidic, we die. So we're talking about a very narrow margin. And when we are changing the pH in our urine, when we're changing the pH in our saliva, that does not necessarily equate to changing your entire systemic level in terms of pH. So I think there's a little bit of some uh, misinformation out there that makes one assume that, okay, if I do these, you know, if I have alkalized water, if I have an alkaline diet, then I'm entirely alkaline and that would be better. That said, I will say that absolutely a more alkaline diet is um, you know, going to be a healthier scenario for cancer. We know that um, acid and acidic environments are more hospitable for cancers to live. And so we don't want to have more of an acidic state. And generally speaking, well, how do we follow an alkaline-based diet? You have a lot of plant foods in your diet. So if you have a lot of plant foods, those in themselves are generally going to be alkaline. Meat and dairy are acidic. Um, and so that in itself, I think, is balancing. Do you, should you, you know, be purchasing alkaline water? Um, I'm open to that. Um, some people purchase the Kangen water system, which I believe is several thousand dollars. Uh, and I'm not opposed to that if you have that kind of money uh, to spend. Do we have enough research that I think all of you must go out and, and buy that? I don't think we have enough research to say that you should be drinking, you know, that. I would say for water, 
um, even a filtered water I'd be happy with, but I agree that in general, depending on where we live and what kind of uh, what's in our water supply, a filtered water would be a good route to go. Uh, it looks like uh, we're, we're getting some questions, uh, you know, that are sort of related, I think, to diet and stress. Uh, and we have one question about exercise, vigorous exercise, five days per week. And then uh, we're asking we're asking you for sleep recommendations. So, what any thoughts on those two subjects? I would say, um, you know, definitely. I think I like having the um, you know exercise in there. There have been some studies in terms of vigorous versus just general exercise. Um, I'm trying to think in my older booklet, which I don't think is available now online, I actually highlight various trials and the differences of those. Um, but I think in general, we're looking at making sure there's an exercise, you know, just getting an exercise if vigorous isn't doable. That looks like it may have been second part of um, Richard's um, comment in terms of the different things that he's um, doing for his health. Um, in terms of sleep, um, that varies. If we need to simply fall asleep, um, number one, lifestyle-wise, um, I think making sure we are exercising typically helps to induce better sleep, not exercising at night, but exercising earlier in the day to allow for proper sleep. Sleeping in a really dark room allows for better melatonin production. Better melatonin is going to be helpful in terms of uh, improving and facilitating proper sleep. So whether you have making sure all your lights are off, making sure there's no flashing things, making sure we have, you know, blackout curtains or whatever we need, I think can be very beneficial. Um, magnesium, something that can be very calming uh, and beneficial to help induce a relaxation and sleep. Uh, if you have anyone who loves baths, Epsom salt baths are an excellent way to also kind of help uh, induce that. And then another area I look at is cortisol and stress chemistry. And if cortisol is elevated at night, we can do something like passion flower tea, or we may implement a supplement that may incorporate um, different botanicals to help lower cortisol to allow for proper sleep. More often than not with stress-related sleep issues, we can fall asleep, but we wake up at two, three, four in the morning and can't turn ourselves back off. In those scenarios, in an ideal world, I would like to be able to assess that, measure stress chemistry to make sure, and then if that was the case, provide something. There are things like phosphatidylserine, magnolia, um, GABA, theanine, all of those types of things that can help to kind of lower cortisol, which we would not want to do in the beginning of the day or in the middle of the day, but at the end of the day to help facilitate better cortisol values throughout the night. Uh, and there, uh, I give. I do have a sleep blog if you want to look at that one also. That may give you a little more information than I just mentioned um, now. Um, I did also see a question come in about cookbooks, and I do think Rebecca Katz's cookbooks are the most beautifully illustrated. So they are incentivizing to make because they look delicious. She has several cookbooks out. She has one on inflammation. Um, her original one by at a time cookbook um, is great. She even has a new one. I think it's more of a mind body um, one. And she's got some recipes I'm sure you can find online. Um, her last name is K-A-T-Z. She is here in the Bay Area. She's kind of switched her focus now to kind of do some other type of work. But her books are, I think, excellent. Um, and I've used kind of a variety of other ones, but I definitely... Um, hers are kind of across the board from a cancer perspective, I think kind of the best that are that are out there. Okay, now we got a message from the boss here. Uh, I don't know if he wants to speak on his own or if I should just read it. But he, he says, Ann Can has never seen any evidence that CBDs prevent cancer of any type. We would say they are beneficial for symptom management and advanced disease. So. I think that's pretty much what you said. Yep, exactly. And maybe that will continue to evolve and we'll learn more. But at this point, that's exactly where we stand. And then uh, just to follow up on, on the source, it says, any results yet from the UCSF prostate cancer nutrition studies? 
And, I, and then he says, Chan Kenfield via Movember. Um, and I and I definitely work with them. Um, both June and Stacy um, were, you know, part of approving the documents for Prostate Cancer Foundation. Um, in my role now, um, I do outreach presentations, I do conferences, um, but I'm not I'm not on the floors with them, so I don't necessarily see all everything that's kind of put out on a regular basis. So um, I'd have to kind of see what the latest ones are. Oh, there's something else I should mention too. I got a note here from a late comer who who may not realize that this is being recorded, and we'll make make this whole presentation available. Uh, we had a number of questions about uh, particular foods. We have one here from uh, McKay asking about eggs and choline. What, what's the story on those? As far um, as that's a good one, actually, because there is a potential concern of eggs being linked with prostate cancer, and it seems that it is directly related to choline. So, and choline is something that we're going to find. Um, and it's the richest source, you know, in terms of it being in eggs. Um, in that case, I typically still allow eggs in a prostate cancer diet. If we're having a lot of those or want to have more of them, then I would suggest doing more egg whites and limiting the number of egg yolks, which is where the, you are getting the majority, significant majority of choline. Um, we do need more research here, but this is an area that if I'm looking at dietary supplements, I do try to find supplements that do not contain choline for prostate patients. That can be challenging sometimes looking at B vitamins, looking at multis um, for prostate because we tend to put phosphatidylcholine, a little, a little bit of choline in there. Um, and choline's great for liver function and brain health, but there does appear to be a possible concern related to prostate cancers. So I do think it's wise to limit egg intake if you're having, uh, you know, five, seven, 10 or more eggs a week, I would say switch more to higher amounts of egg whites. And then I have no, I have no qualms about um, the kind of the amount of egg whites there. You know, during your presentation, you mentioned microbiome. And I, I don't know what the familiarity level is in this audience. Maybe you can explain a little bit about what microbiome is and how, you know, how that can affect our diet and maybe talk a little bit about prebiotics and probiotics? I could talk about prebiotics and probiotics for 10 hours straight, so that could be a difficult one. But just as a little snapshot, um, your microbiome is basically, you know, all of our bacteria, our fungus, our virus, like, and everything, you know, in our system, as well as the collective genetic material. And it basically is the basis of our you know, system. So we have several pounds of us that are simply based on our microbiome. And the microbiome is intricately linked with virtually every type of health related condition. So being able to um, modulate the microbiome and diversify our microbiome is definitely a way, not at this point that we would say, oh, you can reduce your risk of prostate cancer. We don't have research to show that, but certainly to improve gut function, to benefit your immune system, to possibly modulate body weight. Um, you know, a lot of you know, areas that we are going to be looking at with the microbiome. And probiotics are our good beneficial bacteria to facilitate proper digestion and absorption of our nutrients to enhance proper um, you know, mucosal barrier function, to make sure that we are getting, you know, killing off the bad pathogenic bacteria, and also helping us just simply to not have you know, acid reflux and constipation and diarrhea and bloating and so forth. Um, so that is a component of our entire microbiome. Prebiotics are the fuel or the food for your probiotics. So those are gonna typically be in a variety of different plant foods, everything from flaxseed to leeks to mushrooms to seaweed to onions to berries to rye, kind of all different types of plant foods provide you that fuel to have your probiotics grow. And that's one of the reasons we want to have a 
strongly kind of plant-based diet that allows you just to naturally constantly be improving your endogenous or your own body's production of your good probiotics or your good bacteria. Then, then we have a specific question uh, from Kevin. Uh, and I'm not sure one of his what one of his abbreviations it means, but he says, do you find uh, lower vitamin B12 levels in men who are on WFPB? I don't know. Sounds like a radio station. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what that is. Is it a Western diet or something? If so, would you recommend getting B12 supplements and in what dosage? Um, I don't know what the WFPB is. Oh, whole food plant based. Ah, got it. Um, I haven't necessarily, you know, always seen that. I definitely always measure B12 levels. Um, I think. If you're not able to do a full spectra cell related report that's going to look at all of these micronutrients, I would say that um, definitely requesting an MMA, methylmalonic acid, uh, as M as in Mary, um, that is a good marker of B12, functional B12 status. It's a much better marker than looking at a serum B12 marker. If there's any question, is look at an MMA. If you've got good levels, great. If not, then um, we would look there. I use um, oftentimes 500 micrograms, sometimes I'm using 1,000 micrograms of B12, um, depending on genomics, which we haven't even got to, but I'm not going to cover that necessarily tonight, but I definitely also incorporate uh, genomic SNPs in terms of how that affects uh, recommendations. Um, I oftentimes use either methylcobalamin, um, if there was a COMT variant, then I would use an adenosyl hydroxycobalamin type of vitamin B12. Yeah, you know, um, Ken brings up an interesting question, you know, what's with the doctors and diet? And I, you know, I know generally, you know, doctors who are knowledgeable about diet didn't really necessarily learn that much about it in medical school. They had to do it on their own. But, you know, for example, I see a preventive cardiologist and the only thing, you know, I ask all these guys that I've seen, uh, you know, what diet do you recommend? And he said, you know, you should go on the Mediterranean diet. And, uh, you know, and then he does, then he gets a little vague about what that, that is. And, you know, then, then we hear about ketogenic diets and uh, all these diets. Uh, you know, how, how do they fit in for men on, on active surveillance? Is there some, I mean, you laid out a diet, but what would you call your diet? Is it WFPB or what is it? I think that in terms of active surveillance, you know, a whole foods plant-based diet makes perfect sense. Um, with prostate cancer, ketogenic diet's not the right way to go. Ketogenic diet's for glioblastoma, uh, possibly from some other types of cancers, but for prostate cancer, I do not recommend it, and I would actually advise against following a ketogenic diet for one with prostate cancer, just in terms of the way the molecular pathology functions for uh, prostate patients. Um, Mediterranean diet is kind of a, you know, a, you know, would be okay. But also very, you know, lots of plant foods, omega-3 fatty acids, um, a lot of general chronic, you know, um, health issues were associated with improving with a Mediterranean, you know, based diet. And I do think in terms of prostate cancer, it kind of depends on kind of where you're located. I mean, I could say that, you know, when I first started at UCSF, when I was seeing patients clinically, um, the chief of urologic oncology, Dr. Peter Carroll, um, referred every patient, you know, to me. So he was very much in favor of supporting uh, nutrition and how much that played a role um, for his patients, whether they were doing active surveillance, whether they were going to have surgery, or whether they were going to do radiation, or if they had more advanced disease. Um, I think oftentimes, uh, you know, practitioners simply may not have the time or the knowledge. And at UCSF Cancer Center, we're fortunate that, uh, and actually even initially, many, many years back, uh, Peter was who paid for my salary to make that happen. And if you don't have somebody who supports the you know, nutrition as a whole, then you don't have that. And so then the, the practitioners don't have anyone to refer to. And so they simply just don't discuss it or 
you know, give you more of a generic response and then you're kind of on your way, but you're out there kind of uh, scrambling and not knowing exactly what the next steps would, you know, would be. But even if in your situation that's the case, then touch base with me. Happy to work with, you know, happy to work with any of you um, to, you know, form a more personalized plan uh, based on your specific situation. Yeah, the the practical uh, Ken Mason, uh, who speaks for every man, uh, says keeping in mind the age of most men with prostate cancer. So I think he's calling us old farts. Would you suggest cooking classes? It is one thing to change your diet, but knowing how to cook a new way is just as important as knowing uh, what foods to eat and what foods to avoid. So I'm I'm wondering these days are there any YouTube series that that would be useful to uh, to old timers like us to learn how to cook? Um, I don't know in terms of a YouTube series though there very well could be one. There was a program that was through UCSF called Nourish for Life, and they were doing them virtually because of COVID. So you theoretically could kind of um, get in with that. Um, I'm speaking on Friday for a conference, it's a Bay Area um, Cancer Connections, which is generally focused on breast and gynecological based cancers, which prostate cancer is not. But the presentation they asked me to do is an interactive cooking demonstration. So I'm doing a cooking demo and then I'll be doing some Q&A. So that presentation is certainly appropriate for all of you. If you're interested in having you know, a live cooking demonstration, you can go on to uh, Bay Area Cancer Connections. Their annual conference is Friday. Um, and my presentation is from 12 to 1.20 Pacific time. Um, I, I know we're gonna be recording it. I don't know when and how that recording will be available, um, but if that's something you wanna definitely, um, you know, could be, you know, could work with that. But um, I do know we could also keep in mind the UCSF Nourish for Life program, and that may be another, you know, option there too, to get some good um, ideas. And I'd say, you know, the good thing about diet is um, somebody mentioned, you know, um, a little bit earlier and just in terms of the chat is that it's empowering. You know, we don't have control over everything, but you do have control over your diet and your lifestyle. And so in that way, I think that it can be a very empowering tool that you can utilize to your advantage. And uh, if you're like, I want to do this and I want to have my food taste really good and I enjoy cooking or I'm going to get interested in cooking, by all means, go for a cooking class. If you're thinking, I do not want to do any cooking, but I want to be, um, you know, eating well, we can, you can do things in a very simplistic, you know, fashion that wouldn't necessarily require cooking classes, but if you want a little bit more excitement, that could certainly be an excellent option. So I think Ken should follow you on Friday and become sort of a stalker and learn how to become a cook. <laughs> just, I have just a question a, about just how you work. Do you norm? I mean, do you normally work remotely? I mean, it can you know if we're obviously on the other coast or somewhere in the middle of the country? Is that cool? Or, you know? Yeah, I mean, I have I do have for many years had patients from all over the country although clearly most people are in the Bay Area but even as Howard alluded uh, we didn't go all the way across the country we went a pretty good way uh, across the country um, but now with COVID it's kind of opened the door that now you know and particularly for California the way the licensing works is I'm able to work with um, you know anyone from any of the states um, being that I'm here in California. So um, I do work with those phone video consults. And since COVID, I've have picked up more patients where I'm thinking, okay, wait, they're in New York, they're in New Jersey, they're in Virginia, what's our time change? Making sure that we set a time that we're both clear on when that is. So uh, definitely doable. Thank you. Now we, we're gonna have a speaker in a couple of months uh, a cardiologist from Canada, and he, he says, you know, you guys with prostate cancer are worrying about the wrong thing. You should be worrying about your hearts. You're more likely to die from heart disease than you are from prostate cancer. 
And sort of the next step is, is, you know, why not just go on a heart healthy diet? Is that any different from a cancer healthy diet? There can be some nuances to that. And I would say that um, the average person, average male, yeah, heart disease is um, a higher killer than prostate cancer. But I think that if one's been diagnosed with prostate cancer, then we that definitely kind of ratchets up higher on the priority list. Uh, and I would be inclined to say, oh, let's test and look at these different cardiac parameters and see where is the risk? Is there a risk? What about lipoprotein little a? What about looking at the size of these lipoprotein particles, are they large and buoyant and not atherogenic or are they small and dense and atherogenic? And then we would focus there accordingly. But a lot of things in terms of the plant foods, uh, in terms of watching certain types of fatty acids, green tea, um, all gonna be beneficial. There could be some that we really do limit carbohydrates. There could be some that we're really being careful in terms of certain fats. And there could be certain dietary supplements that we consider if there is a particular cardiac risk that we may not if there isn't that cardiac risk present. You know, Hugh, Hugh brings up something interesting too. I mean, we talked about heart disease and, and we talked a little bit about diabetes. I mean, uh, you know, one of the participants asked, you know, why are we talking about di diabetes? But that, you know, when I got diagnosed with diabetes in, in addition to heart problems and, uh, and prostate cancer, you know, that's that's where I noticed a conflict. And I think you sort of addressed that and what you were talking about on the balance between uh, vegetables and fruit, that, you know, you would tend to recommend uh, a higher balance or a larger amount of, or a bigger amount of uh, vegetable and fruit. And, you know, that gets into the uh, diabetes diets where, where they're sort of discouraging fruit because of the sugar. And I think that's what Hugh is getting at. So how do, how do you sort all that out? Again, partially going to be based on what's the A1C? Is it an issue or is it not? But in general, I think that having, you know, two to three pieces, um, if you're a larger individual, having three to four pieces of fruit on a daily basis, the benefits of the vitamins, of the minerals, of the phytochemicals, the dietary fiber are going to outweigh the cons of it having some natural sugar. Now, I'm definitely saying whole fruit as opposed to fruit juices uh, and, few, you know, other kinds of, you know, scenarios. But in terms of eating whole fruit, um, I think that definitely can be incorporated. But that is one of, that is the reason we would want to have you know, double, triple the amount of vegetables than fruit, so that that way you're not getting in an excess amount of just even natural, you know, sugar. So I wouldn't want to see nine fruits and one vegetable. Um, I'd rather see that kind of six vegetables, two, three fruit kind of a general um, idea. Yeah, you know, in terms of, um, let's see, somebody else is saying, should we avoid fruits? You're not saying that. Sorry, I missed that. It kind of it uh, yeah. vibrated a little bit. Yeah, they somebody brings up the question: Should we avoid fruit because of sugar levels? You're 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 not saying that. Correct. I'm saying that you can you can. I mean, again, we'd want to base it on your biochemistry, but um, generally speaking, I think eating two, three pieces of fruit a day, the benefits outweigh the cons in terms of the sugar. Now, you know, it's interesting. Anthony Henry's from uh, Toronto, and uh, he is he is basically a asking how your system works. And you know, I don't know if it's true for for most of us, but you know, I saw Natalie as a patient, and she she ordered a blood test for me, and uh, I you know I got the results, and based on my nutrition levels. You know, she recommended specific uh, supplements for me. I don't know if that's what Anthony is getting at, but I don't know what the rules are in Canada. Um, Medicare in the United States, much to my surprise, covered this very expensive test. And, you know, and I would guess that most of the 24 of us who are here, I, you know, you're all very small on my screen, so I can't see you raise your hands, but I bet most of us have not had that test. So maybe you could fill Anthony in a little bit about 
what your procedure is and what that test is and you know what does it cost and how do you get it there are i mean uh there are many many different tests that i consider so it really would be based on what do we think would be the most appropriate um, for you know each person as an individual anything that we can do through insurance obviously we try to do that in terms of anything mainstream that can be run through a physician so even in canada maybe let we say oh could your physician please run a b c d labs and that should be able to be run accordingly um, in reference to the spectra cell micronutrient test, if we did want to look at that panel of all those different um, labs, that can definitely be done. Um, they've changed their policies even just in terms of as of September this year. That test is a blood draw. Um, that kit can be mailed to you wherever you are. Um, I have to check in terms of direct, you know, is it something that could be in terms of Canada, but it, definitely within the United States, I know it can be mailed, but it may be that it'd be fine uh, in Canada too, just that the insurance thing would be a little different. They now are only accepting Medicare insurance. So if you have Medicare, that test is $110. Um, if you don't have Medicare, it's $420. Um, unless I buy it and you reimburse me, then it's $320. So I would say that, you know, as long as it's fine for it to be sent from Canada to the US, which we'd have to confirm, that particular test we could do and it just wouldn't go through insurance. Instead, it would just be a directly kind of out of pocket cost. If you have, if you're not Medicare or even, I'm not sure how it works in Canada, but if there's, um, you know, flexible spending accounts, HSA things, those definitely the test can go towards that my fees can go towards that uh and work that way um and if we didn't have access to things there's you know sometimes if there's digestive issues we're looking at stool analyses uh if we're thinking in terms of stress being a driving force we may look at a something called the dutch test there are numerous different things that i would consider i would not run numerous tests uh you know all at once by any means but just kind of being able to prioritize what do we think we would really get the most bang for your buck out of both, even if it didn't cost you anything, but just making sure we're going to get a lot of value for anything that we were to undertake in terms of a test. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm getting signals that uh, I should turn it over to uh, Joe. Yeah, I want to thank you, Natalie, for coming out and, uh, you know, kind of updating us on uh, nutrition, diet, et cetera. And uh, consider that you're receiving thunderous applause right now. So Joe, it's up to you. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, you, you, it was really good. Go ahead. What were you saying, Natalie? I said, happy to be here. Thanks everyone for good questions and engagement. Love it. Well, well, we're we're really pleased that that you could make it and that you could be with us. Uh, and and we had a a reasonably good attendance and a lot of information. Uh, the one thing I I do want to mention about that is that uh, everything that you've the presentation tonight and all is going to be included through the uh, the ANCAN uh, site under the uh, the heading of nutrition. So that way, uh, as well as we'll have it also posted out on uh, YouTube. So that all of this will be available uh, for everyone who is not familiar. Our chats are also registered on your computer under documents or the equivalent for uh, whatever it is for the uh, the Apple computer. So that's a, that's important to mention as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention too before we before everybody starts taking off on us. Um, to highlight the fact that us too is going to be doing a, uh, uh, a, a under their prostate cancer connections uh, webinar, they're going to be doing one on imaging and prostate cancer on uh, Tuesday, November 24th at 7 p.m. Central Time. We got to make sure we can keep our time zone straight, and you can register at the U2, U, us too, rather, uh, dot org, uh, connections. Uh, website as well so make sure you you know you keep that aware um and the uh what was the other thing that i wanted to mention um well we all we are going to uh, include the references for uh, for natalie's uh publications and pamphlets and the references 
to the uh, UCSF sites so that you'll be able to get a lot more detail as well as the, uh, the presentation slides. So that way we'll have all of that. Because there was an awful lot we got covered tonight. And it's uh, you know a, a ton of information, and I know for sure I definitely want to get back and reference more of it for my own personal well-being as well. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, someone, I thought someone wanted to chime in there for a moment. Uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to do these these uh, once a month, and uh, if uh, if Natalie be willing, we'll uh, we'll invite her back because, uh, uh, like I said, that was a that was quite a bit of information. I, I have a, a page and a half of notes for myself, so I know that everybody else must have a, have, a, have as much as well. So, and I, I'm wondering, did Natalie? Did your intern show up? Yeah, she was on Kelly. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, I saw Kelly. She she turned her cam webcam off, but she's she's sitting with us. Oh, okay. There she is. She's waving with. She's got the puppies. <laughs> now this is the first time we've had uh, dogs. Well, we've heard dogs. We hear dogs all the time, but dogs are welcome too. Yep. <laughs> Hi everyone. Yes, they were um, sleeping in my arms for a bit, but yeah, we had some glass breaks. I have to hold them. Anyways, my camera was off, but. Well, you, you're certainly welcome. Um, you know, I think I think we're pretty much set unless uh, there's some other reminders. The uh, chat contained links to to a lot of information, including I think the nutrition uh, meeting on Friday that Ken's going to go to, and um, <laughs> and and there's links to the booklets from uh, UCSF, two booklets. And, you know, and, Joe, and the how, how is and the, re the registrations for our webinars too, the, the upcoming ones? Yeah, you guys got to come to our webinars on uh, November 30th, where we're going to have Antonio Westphalen, formerly of UCSF and now of University of Washington, talking about MRIs. And uh, December 30th, we're going to have the king of Gleason scores, uh, Dr. Epstein. So sign up. The, the last two webinars uh, were filled to, to capacity. Yeah, and that information is also it's at the beginning of the chat window. So you can go back and scroll through that and pick up the, uh, the links for that. Or you can find it on the ANCAN website. So I think that's it, guys. I think we Next, had a, we, Next week, uh, it'll just be regular support group. Wednesday yeah. night next yeah. week. Yep. Yep. Please. I appreciate it. Be there. Or, yeah, be there or be square or something. Something. So. Thanks again, Natalie. It was fantastic. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Thanks, right. Kelly Thanks, and dogs. Oh. Oh. Pups. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, everybody. And Joe, Joe, were you able to catch any newbies? There, there were none that I that uh, at least identified themselves. I I, I I saw David Long. I don't remember seeing David before. Yeah, the 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 the, the one good thing is we have a. Uh, a high interest and a high attendance. The other thing is it's uh, really difficult to keep track of how many new people we pick up as we go along. So well, I, see, I, I see McKay is still connected. He, he seemed like a newbie to me. I don't remember that name. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I think I think McKay's been with us before, but I, I, you know, I really didn't get any contact there. He didn't, uh, he didn't come in with his, with an audio pin. He um, yeah, he had a lot of good questions. A yeah, very uh, lively program, I think. Yeah. So, so Joe, do you want to meet with us, or are you going to kick yeah, us out? Yeah, we could, Well, we can, we can, we can take a minute. Have uh, you turned off the recording, by the by? I will in a moment. 
Okay. I'm, I'm taking care of uh, some of the other housekeeping. Um, the basically shutting that part of it down. And we'll go over here and there we go. 